All right. Um, so if we start with you telling, uh, t- tell me about your your background in terms of your qualifications, studies, everything you studied to to, to really to be where you are now in your profession, um, and um, yeah, just to catch up anyone who doesn't know about you. Right. Well, for anybody that doesn't know me, my name's Paul Townley. I'm a, a physiotherapist. That sounds a bit weird saying it like that. <laughs> But um, my actual profession is a physiotherapist, but my master's degree is in manual therapy, which uh, I did a master's degree, which was a, a, the physiotherapy version of uh, chiropractic and osteopathy. Originally, uh, I, I basically spent from, well, I left school at 16, and uh, I worked in just about every job you can imagine, everything from working in buildings, bar work. I used to grow worms in different types of um, material, should we say. In England, all this. In, this was all in England, yeah. <laughs> I worked for a research station. Uh, I used to even uh, even humped gear on the stage for different bands in the, what was then the new wave of British heavy metal. So quite a few of the very big bands now, like Def Leppard and that, I actually humped gear on and off the stage for them. Wow. Uh, I worked in bars. Like I said, I did building. Um, I was a security guard, all different types of cleaning, decorating. What parts of the UK? Uh, I was mainly around London. I did work up in the north a little bit, but mainly around London. So, I mean, basically, at the time, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with myself. And then I started travelling. Um, I originally ended up, first of all, ended up in the States as a swimming instructor in a summer camp. And uh, I did that, and then I was travelling around and... Uh, are you a swimmer or you just found your way into that position? <laughs> Do I look like a swimmer? Uh, I was. Maybe you did, yeah. <laughs> when, I was, when I was young and fit before I got married, I was, uh, um, yeah, I used to swim a little bit and I was not a bad teacher, I suppose. Um, I basically travelled around and uh, ended up in different places and eventually I decided to uh, um, uh, uh, learn to be a physiotherapist and I... I'd been working in all these different jobs, in factory jobs. I was on a kibbutz for a while, where I worked in the uh, in the orchards and in the in the factories, and even in the uh, the cow sheds and things like that, milking. And then after that, I lived there. I went back was to that England. part of the travelling? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just travelling basically from the age of twenty till about the age of thirty-two, something like that. Wow. And uh, eventually, I just thought, well, I can't keep doing this. Uh, it's all very well, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life working in factories or cow sheds or growing worms. So I was actually quite clinical about it, and I sat down and I got a. I went into a library in uh, St Albans, which is where I'm more or less from, and uh, sat down with the Compendium of Jobs. And I don't know if you know this, but there is actually a massive, great book. It's a huge, great volume with every job from A to Z. And I sat down and I went through. All the things that I liked, I had a little list of, of things that I liked doing, what I was interested in at school, what I, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. And then I just went through the the various jobs and tried to match them to the list. And I came up with a pilot. Well, that's out because I'm colorblind, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> Me too, by the way. <laughs> and uh, great fun, isn't it? Um and then uh, I thought osteopathy, but uh, uh, in England at the time, you to do osteopathy, you had to have quite a lot of money to be able to do it. And I wasn't particularly flush with money, as they say. And then the next thing was like physiotherapy. So I looked at that and I, I, I realized that there were quite a lot of um, branches to physiotherapy. Is can, it still, sorry, is it still the same today in terms of needing more financial backing to become an oste- osteopath? To be, uh, to be honest, I couldn't tell you. I imagine so. Be- the difference being is that because physiotherapy comes under the National Health Service, we used to get a, a grant and things like that. So basically my education was paid for when I did it. I don't think it's the same now. I, um, yeah, but and at the time, osteopathy wasn't included, osteopathy, is that? Definitely not. It was, uh, you had to pay for it. It was a private school. Yeah, and so, why, was it, um, given the choice, if you could go left or right, osteopathy or physiotherapy, would you have gone if they covered your studies? No, I think, I, I, well, this is what happened, was I, I looked into it, and I thought, well, it sounds interesting. I didn't really want to work in urology or in a medical f- part of physiotherapy, but I realised that there's the, a very, very big part of it can be working in the orthopaedic area. 
And working in that orthopaedic area gives you a lot more options than maybe osteopathy would do, like for working in sports, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit, but uh, a, a lot more things than I could have done with, with osteopathy. And in addition to that, the big thing in osteopathy was being able to do manipulation and soft tissue work. But if you wanted to progress as such in uh, physiotherapy, you could also do your master's in that and go on and specialise in that area. It just meant you, you did your physiotherapy degree, you did your um, your rotations as it was then or probably called internship now, which is like a two year um, period and quite a few nice stories about that. But uh, basically you work in a hospital after you've done your physiotherapy degree. As part of your physiotherapy degree, you will do obviously the university part, yep. but you do various placements and um, you go to each area of uh of physiotherapy, whether it be uh, respiratory or neurology or working with uh, um, the older generation and all these different things. And so like touching a bit of different areas. Yeah, of, yeah. yeah, touching more than a bit. You learn those specific areas. And one of the areas is obviously orthopedic, sort of um, spinal sports injury type area. I knew I wanted to go into that. When you finish your degree, you you will do a placement in each one of those areas, by the way, and sometimes twice, especially for the orthopedic or... And how long does each rotation uh, last? It depends. If, for example, a medical rotation could be uh, just a month, but uh, the, should we say, the uh, outpatient clinic or, or whatever is that, that's about a month and then another one for a month in the advanced part. Your surgery part can be a month and then you're an advanced part for another month. And that goes on for three years. Yeah. But having done that at the time that I was studying, if you had any sense at the time, when you finished and you were qualified, and you were qualified as a, a physiotherapist, you would then go on and do your rotations. Now, the rotations are basically your placements or your internships, again, for four months. So you would go and do neurology for four months. You would go and do um, care of the elderly for four months. You would go and do medical or surgery for four months. You could go and do outpatients for four months and then again for another four months because it's quite a, a big body of work. Um, and you would just travel around the hospital like junior doctors. In fact, I was with a junior doctor, um, the same junior doctor for all of my rotations until she went off to do um, um, uh, her, uh, her GP, her general practitioner rotation, and I went off back to do uh, my outpatients again. You do orthopaedic wards and everything, and you do that for two years. At the end of that, you then go on to become what they call a, a senior two. Prior to that, you're known as a junior physio. Now, I was 35, and people calling me junior was really getting on my nerves. I was quite glad to get in to be a senior. Yeah, but when, so were you, in fact, older than the rest of your yeah, classmates? Yeah, I, I actually, yeah. like I said, I was traveling for about 10, 11 years. I, I actually went into university when I was 32. Yeah. Um, and then I finished it when I was 35, and then I started doing my rotations. And then, I, uh, having done that, for a couple of years, they made a... Uh, somebody saw some sort of potential in me and uh, made me a clinical educator. So I was then teaching for a couple of years. At what age was that, the teaching? Uh, I would have been in my, towards my late thirties by then. Uh, and the guy that was my clinical facilitator or my clinical instructor when I was doing my outpatients uh, um, rotations and my outpatients uh, uh, placements, I just all seemed to be in the same hospital all the time. And he went to work for Crystal Palace Football Club. And he wanted, at the time, there was a big thing where football clubs, and this, we're talking back now, back in the mid-90s. English football yeah, for our pre American yeah, listeners. Yeah. Sorry about this, <laughs> soccer. <coughs> um, I, you know, our job convincing these Englishmen that you can't, you can't call it football, as you well know yourself. Um, so uh, what happened was in the 90s, a lot of the, football clubs had physiotherapists that weren't, shall we say, chartered physiotherapists. They would do a course that the Football Association was running, which could be up to about six months, not like a three-year course plus another two years or whatever. And there was a big problem because people didn't really want 
they wanted to get chartered physios because they're far more qualified, far better qualified. So what happened was that it just so fell at the time that the academy system in, in Britain at the time was basically coming into its own. So anybody of those that, that don't know soccer or football in England, at one point you had the footballers, the kids would do their apprenticeship, but they basically bought it into the 21st or whatever century and opened up academies where the kids would go there from about the age of 14, 15, or even younger, 13, and stay there and be taught and live in a home with somebody that was attached to the club. And they would attend the academy, they would have lessons, the, the club would pay for their education, help their education, as well as them being footballers. And then they would go through the this academy process until they reached 19, whether they would either be taken on permanently or not. And they wanted... Which is completely the norm now. But now, then now it was it's completely every, new, yeah, right? It was, yeah. a, it was a big new thing and it was only happening in premiership football. Yeah. Now, if you think in premiership football, these guys were worth tens of millions of pounds, certainly tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. In quite a few f football clubs, in premiership, at premiership level, did not have chartered physios. Their physiotherapist would usually have had uh, done a six-month course during the summer and over a period of weeks in the evenings, he would be the physiotherapist. And they would wanted more and more to get chartered physios, qualified physios into the job. And so they did it through the academy. And so what they did, well, they wouldn't give a football club a license to open academies unless they had a chartered physiotherapist looking after the medical well-being that could refer them onto doctors or whatever. Yeah. And, that, you, and you were... And I was taken on as the main academy physio. I had several chartered physios working for me for all the different little teams around London that Crystal Palace was sponsoring. Yeah. But what was happening then was that the, the clubs, not in my club, not in Crystal Palace, because they had a chartered physio, but he brought me in, knowing the value. But a lot of the other clubs didn't have that. They were seeing that the academy were getting better treatment than the first team players. And so they started bringing in chartered physios more and more. And, and that was kind of how it, how it took off. And, and my job, I was the second physio for the professionals, um, which is great, except you don't get to stay in the hotel so much when you do the matches. You can travel all the way up to Newcastle from South London. It's quite a few hours driving. And then you drive all the way back and you had to be at work at six in the morning. So I just used to sleep in the car. Um, because like where I lived, it was nearly a two-hour drive to get to my to the training ground. Wow! Well, um, and then there's also the you are at the end of the day treating players that are worth whatever, millions, however many millions. millions. Yeah. Yeah. Because the reserve teams, I was I was the second physio, so I would travel with the reserve team. Now the reserve teams are all the guys that were coming back from injuries or just coming through, plus the main the academy players. Guys trying to get that break. Yeah, the and there's team. a lot of fairly famous football players that I worked with when they were young kids. And um, and I can say, oh, yeah, I remember treating him. I remember treating him. So ad nauseum to my children. Yeah, yeah. we've heard that one, Dad. Um, so after I, I did that, and then I um, I start, basically started traveling around again. Uh, one of the countries I worked in, I was working in the military, um, working with some of the special forces units as a consult consultant. Um, and at this point, you broke away from... I left Crystal, Crystal Palace. Palace yeah. It was a sad story. The, the problem at, at, at the time was Crystal pa Palace was basically going bankrupt at the time. This was in 1998, 99. And uh, they were going into administration. I knew as the, the second sort of physio that uh, I was going to be given kicked out because... The first, what they needed was to keep the academy open, they needed a chartered physio. So the first fit team physio could take that place. And he just needed an assistant, and she was also chartered, but she was actually my assistant. And I was the one in the middle. And uh, so they would so that save a little bit of money. And at the time, they were kicking everybody out. A lot of people lost their jobs at that time. So I knew it was, uh, it was time to go. And uh, to be honest with you, football, as much fun as it was, signing the autographs, traveling, sometimes staying in hotels going on tours and that's great but um it was starting to get very mundane and i wanted to do a little bit more i wasn't teaching which i like and i liked when i was working in the health service 
So I left and I basically started traveling around again. And uh, I ended up in various countries again and I worked uh, as a physiotherapist and for uh, health organizations and also for the military as a consultant, which I quite enjoyed. I'm sure, and I'll ask you about that, but going back to the football, the sports side, mm -hmm. um, did you want to think about maybe finding a position at a another team, another football team, another sports team? I thought about it. Uh, I was getting itchy feet. Uh, also, my wife wanted to go at the time. She wanted to sort of broaden horizons. So my yeah. wife's Israeli, so she wanted to come back to Israel. Uh, I didn't have a problem with that. So at the time, I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd spent the last three months of the season not getting paid and then getting paid a bit and not getting paid and then getting paid a bit. And The I could, same situation Wayne Rooney was in yeah, last season. Yeah, yeah, but he probably had a few more. But for me, for me, it was a matter of being able to live and put food on the table. And I don't think he was ever in that problem once he got, he got big. I watched a lot of people that I respected get kicked out of jobs having been worked in, working in Crystal Palace for 20, 30 years. And I knew I was going to go. So I just thought, well, okay, if I'm going to go, I'll go. I jumped before they pushed me, so I managed to get uh, uh, keep my wages for that month at least. Yeah. Um, and then my wife wanted to come back to, to Israel, so uh, we, uh, we came back. Funnily enough, uh, there were a couple of Israeli football players at Crystal Palace. And uh, I actually learned a little bit of Hebrew from one of them. And they tried to get me jobs. As soon as I was talking to the managers in the football club, it was bringing up all the old bad memories from Crystal Palace. So I thought, no, I don't need this anymore. I'd rather do something else. I want to get back into teaching. So I went to work for a health organisation. Um, and gradually, as they got used to me, and my Hebrew improved, I started teaching again. And at the same time, I went to work and do different things in the army and different militaries as a consultant. Yeah. Um, Are you still in touch with the world of sports? Do you treat any athletes specifically? Yeah, I still actually, actually see one or two of the, the two players. I see them occasionally around here. As far as sports injury treatment, yeah, I do it privately or uh, do quite a lot of uh, sports injury treatments. And I work quite a lot with sports players. Uh, uh, players and uh, sports athletes yeah. while I was in Britain before I went to Crystal Palace I was actually running a sports injury clinic so I was uh, it just so happened that a few of fairly high class athletes used to come there Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard of it but there's an actually a Decca Iron Man I uh, haven't so there's you have the Iron Man with its sort of what is three mile swim 100 kilometer cycle and a marathon that they do. Yeah. Well, times that by 10. They get a week. They start doing it. And they basically swim 30 miles. They run 260 miles. And they cycle 1,000 miles or 1,000 kilometers or whatever it is. The world champion came to my sports injury clinic when I, just before I went to Crystal Palace for enough. And uh, tell us about his body. He was shorter than I am, which is saying something. <laughs> he was very short, but he was shaped like a big V. His shoulders were enormous and his lats were huge. Um, and he was a postman. Wow. And what he used to do was, again, in different places in the world, but in Britain, postman, and I know this because my brother's one, they basically get their little bag or their big bag in the morning and they go and do their routes. And he always asks for the route with the tower blocks. Now, in America, you've got those nice little boxes that you can go and put your letters in. And, and the same a lot of places around the world, certainly Israel as well, they have these the little um, post boxes that you put the letters in. But in England, it doesn't work like that. They're little slots in the door. Now, if you've got a tower block that's 20 stories high, somebody's got to get up to that 20th floor and it's put all the workout. letters in there. So he asked for the three biggest tower blocks in North London, which is the area we were, and he used to take the bag on him, take three sacks, because you can't leave them downstairs. Whereas these tower blocks are quite high. They're not always the most affluent areas, shall we say. So if they leave their, their bag downstairs, it's not going to be there when they get back. So he used to have to carry it, and he'd 
and he asked for three tower blocks and he used to put the bags, all three bags on him and then run up and down the stairs to, to get his work out, posting all the letters. And he came in with a bad back and like a lot of athletes, it's quite hard. They're very type A personalities. It's very difficult for them to accept that they're mortal and that they are going to get injured and things like that. And, <coughs> excuse me, so they made some, made him a, uh, uh, he did these post things and he had a bad back and he basically arrived and I treated him and I did a lot of teeth by that point I'd done a lot of courses I was working very much in dry needling uh, a lot of soft, soft tissue and trigger point work which is a lot of the things that I kind of teach now and uh, so I started working on his back and we needled him we released all his back and he was he was bent double when he was walking in but he actually came back he was walking and he was great so then we had to rehab him back to doing it uh, doing his, to, so he could do this Decker Iron Man uh, a couple of months later. So the first thing I said was, I want you to get on your bike and I want you to just cycle a couple of miles and see how you feel. I want to take it easy. I remember him turning up on the Monday. He said, I cycled down to Bristol. Now that's from North London to Bristol is about a three hour drive, two and a half hour drive in the car. So he cycled to Bristol. He said, but it's okay. I had to rest. I slept there overnight and cycled back. So I thought, well, you're probably going to be okay. So his next training thing was to do this run around a, a, um, a running track. Now, they do it for 24 hours, non-stop. But what they do is they have to run in one direction, clockwise, say, but it messes up their inner ear. So they have to try, change after an hour and run in the opposite direction. direction. And it's 24 hours non-stop. So that was his next goal. And your goal is to complete as many laps as possible in Yeah, yeah. Hours. And he was yeah. just lapping everybody and he, he won it by about 10 laps. He was the... Um, so I think you're ready to go back to the Deco Ironman. And he was the world champion. So I think we did something right. He got the world, became the world champion of the Deco Ironman or whatever it was at the time. Incredible. And Incredible. Then, I, then I, just after that, I went to work at Crystal Palace. Yeah, so when you were working at, that, at the sports clinic, uh, you must have been exposed to, I'm assuming that's an extreme example, but yeah. so many different athletes from but, so many different Yeah, realms. but the, the majority of people were coming in was the everyday person that had twisted their ankle or pulled a muscle or hurt their back or, or done whatever they'd done. Yeah, is there so, any injury that you, uh, it's, I know it's a weird question, but enjoy to treat? When you see it, 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 ex it almost, almost excites you. You know, I, um, I've, been, I've been injured, I've had uh, surgeries. Um, there's certain doctors when you walk in with a specific uh, injury, it almost uh, excites them to tackle one of these again. Um. Well, the thing with, with a lot of doctors is, especially the orthopedic doctors, they will tend to specialise in a particular area. So it's nice if they get that. Um, I suppose I, it's a weird, it's a good question, actually. I, I, I liked treating backs, but the problem with the backs is that um, they can be a lot of times very chronic and the, uh, um, the approach to that has differed. And why I used to like doing manipulations and things like that and the soft tissue work and the trigger point work and the dry needling work. But uh, I also used to quite like lower, lower limb problems as well, um, either chronic lower limb or even sort of acute lower limb, like some of the ankle problems. Everyone has back issues, though. Huh? Yeah, that's the thing. It starts to get a little bit, you know. We're talking then I was in maybe my first four or five years as a physio, so everything was new and exciting to me. But after you've worked, and it doesn't matter if you work in a sports injury clinic, if you work in the military, certainly in the military, um, you work in a day-to-day -day clinic, the um, the overall uh, the problem with the backs is they tend to be, it's kind of get a bit to be the same. Whereas a nice ankle or a nice strain yeah, yeah. like that is, is a bit of fun to do sometimes. There's a, we do some of the courses and the clinical reasoning courses that we do for, dare I say that word after the discussion we had the other day. <laughs> but, uh, the clinical, clinical assessment. Yeah, the the approach that I use, you know, a lot of people will come in with an ankle sprain after six months that may have a, shall we say, a, a, um, a diagnosis of an ankle sprain because there was a tear in the ligament. But six months down the line, that tear is probably not the thing that's causing the pain. It could be something neurodynamic or soft tissue work, you know, the, ten, the ligament itself is not going to be the, the cause of the pain. 
So it can be something physical or it could even be sort of a psychosocial aspect, which we can look into. So I'm sort of more interested, became more interested in treating lower limb and upper limb problems. At that point, I moved into football, so I was treating a lot of lower limb problems. Yeah. As you know yourself, that's where it's going to happen yeah. with uh, quite a lot of backs. Um, as I moved, I started working in a health service again, a lot of backs, a lot more on backs. Uh, but then I started working in the military, again, a lot of lower limb problems, a lot of ankle sprains, a lot of um, an the anterior knee pain or knee pain from the, the patella, uh, some hips and again, backs, the occasional, quite a fair few dislocated shoulders because of the weight that they're carrying and yeah. falling. Um, so, I, I, but I was more sort of lower limb orientated. I quite enjoyed. Yeah, and obviously, when you're there. treating lower limbs in a football team like Crystal Palace, it's not only you're treating those specific cases, but every injury, every second, every day a player's not training, it's costing money. Yeah, um, I think that was one of the, that was one of the things that kind of got um, helped me decide not to stay in football. When I think about it, that was. I didn't like the kind of the politics of it. I wanted to treat people. I found that at the beginning it was great. I was treating and I was doing their rehab and everything. But as time went by, what, what would happen is I would treat them. But as soon as I could get them back to almost just walking, they would go to the fitness trainer and the fitness trainer would kind of do the, the rehabilitation, which is kind of what I was meant to be doing, but it didn't work out that way. But I still had to go down and report to the managers why this player wasn't playing or whatever. And I didn't really have any control over it. It was it was difficult. I didn't like the politics. And I was just, I, I had a few years there, a few good years, I but enjoyed do you, it. Do you think it's because at least then it was a new thing, having chartered physiotherapists? No, no, that was how people always worked. It was just uh, mm. probably probably to the managers, it was more annoying because I had somebody could actually say, well, no, this isn't the way you should do it. We should do it this way and that way and they need like you say you, you've got million dollar or million pound players yeah and the manager wants good news and they want and they don't want them sitting on the bench the other thing is 90 percent 99 percent of managers were football players now they know that it's not always valid or true what that player is saying we knew that the player was just didn't fancy training because it was too cold and he'd forgotten his gloves or something. And that happened a lot. But we couldn't take the chance because if something happened, God forbid, then we would have been responsible for letting him go out. So the player knew that, so he could play on us. And he didn't even have to go and do the dirty work of telling his manager. But his manager knew that he was probably playing around and, as you say, working on us a little bit. Um because he'd done exactly the same when he was a player. So it was it was this thing. And I didn't mind it at first. But after a while, I wanted to just be able to do my job and, and enjoy my job. And I didn't like the politics. Plus, we had this problem with uh, not getting paid as well. So it was a time for me to move on. Yeah. Um, but having that pressure of um, needing to heal a player within a couple of days, within a week, within the time frame for the next Premier League match or the next cup game. Um, how how was that? How was that dynamics needing to treat someone on a clock? The thing the thing with football or with any sport, I, I when I left university and I worked for the health service as start as a junior physiotherapist, pretty much within about two months, three months, I started working for a rugby team, and then I started working for a football team, all at a semi professional level, and this was while I was working in the sports injury clinic and in the national health service. I mean, I'm not lying. I was doing 80-hour weeks, 85-hour weeks. I don't know how my wife put up with it. <laughs> yeah. I would go to work in the, the morning, I'd sort of start working at 7.38, work to 5. After that, I would either do a sports injury clinic or rugby team or football team. Um, and I was doing that every day of the week. Wow. And then on the, seven, on the Sunday, so I stayed rounded, I was working in an old people's home. And that was my day off. But I would only work seven hours then. But uh, so I was working like that and getting experience. Now, the thing I learned, and it really did help me become a better physio, was because when you're running onto a pitch, 
there's so many things going on around you. Uh, you know yourself. I mean, how many times did you go over and take the bottle out of the physio's bag when he's run onto the pitch? Yeah, it's like... Uh, and he's searching for it to give, give water to the guys lying on the floor and you're standing 10 yards away drinking his water. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's almost, uh, it's ironic, but you're almost happy for that uh, break in the game yeah. for the physio to run on. You get a sip of water or maybe some Gatorade or yeah, something. Yeah, like which I actually wanted to give to the, the guy that's lying yeah, on yeah, the floor. Yeah. Um, but that running on and having to make those split decisions because I've got something going on, usually three players in my bag playing with my scissors or <laughs> trying to get some tape out to do their fingers or something like that. And you know all this because you've done it yourself. Um, the referee going, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. The guy lying on the floor with his knee twisted up behind his head and I'm going to decide if he's done his cruciate ligaments or... Or, how or, bad or just it, needs a break. Or just, just doesn't fancy it. I mean, I actually I actually pulled my Achilles tendon running onto somebody <laughs> who had, fell right the other side of the pitch. And I'm not the lightest thing on my feet. And I ran right to the other side of the pitch, got to him, and he was lying there. He said, I'm just having a rest. I could have killed him. <laughs> and he's lying there, and everyone's getting on there. You go on there, but you're making these decisions, especially if it's bad. And sometimes they can be bad. Yeah, and um, you have the fans. And you have the foul. fans. I'll get to that bit. And all the abuse from the fans, um, and you'll uh, you're trying to make those decisions. So it, it, this clarity of thought that you develop um, has stood me in good stead to this very day. That now somebody comes in and I can make fairly quick decisions when I'm under a lot of pressure. That I see other younger physios, and I'm, I'm 61. I don't mind saying it. No, uh, that are a lot fitter and healthier than I am. And, and not just because they're new, they may have been in the game already 10 years, but their clarity of thought isn't the same thing. And that football definitely gave that to me, it gave me a lot of interesting time. The worst bit was the fans, because like I said, every player, he's never going to fall down by the bench. Never. Yeah. I've never known it happen. <laughs> He'll always fall at the furthest point he can. And Sometimes he'll... it's based on managers and strategies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Especially often, if you're winning the game. Often he'll do it when you're at the goal mouth at one end and then he decides to fall at the goal mouth at the other end and you've got to run the length of the pitch. Now, I've always been quite a portly gent um, for quite a few years. Running from one side of the pitch to the other takes me a bit of time and it is of great amusement to most of the fans. Some of the language and the things that happened. The worst place I ever did it was at Millwall because for some reason... Even the reserve games are full at Millwall, and it's a big pitch. Yeah, and the abuse and I used known, to get—they're known for their yeah. abusive. Um, they're not behavior. the nicest of people, and at least when, then they were. Still, are, I think. <laughs> when I used to get to the end of the pitch, and I'd like, and then they'd be spitting at me or throwing things at me and giving you all this abuse, and they'd go back and say, "When I we got back in the change rooms, I used to say to the players, thanks for that.' You know, the grief I got because you fancied having a rest, but it did. It got me." Very, very clear thinking. Um, helped me make diagnosis, good diagnosis properly that I could then work on. You're and also working um, on daily injuries with very fit young individuals, right? Yeah, and I think that's probably the big thing is that they're often when I'm teaching, I've gone back into teaching now in a big way. Uh, I teach uh, for various universities around the world um, and I teach obviously for, for NAT. And one of the things I would say to people uh, when they'll say, oh, I'm going to go to a sports therapist. Well, I'm sorry, but sports therapists are not more qualified than any other physiotherapist. Physiologically, and I'll often ask people this, physiologically, what's the difference between a fit young man like yourself twisting his ankle and a very unfit old man like me twisting my ankle? Physiologically. Apart from you being younger and your ability to heal a bit quicker and everyone say, yeah, yeah, but then they, they want to get better. They want to improve quickly. And yeah, but I didn't say psychologically. I said physiologically. You're right. The big thing the difference is, is the motivation to get back to sport is much greater. A lot more pronounced. So it's nice to work with that. It's a double edged sword. Often players or high level athletes and anybody that's worked with high level athletes will know this 
I said it earlier on, they suddenly come in contact with their mortality. They realise that, oh yeah, they can get hurt. And because sport like soccer or any sport is a very doggy dog world, one, if they're out of the game, it's detrimental to their ability to play in the future because they kind of get pushed to the side as well as how much it can affect the team which again comes back to that because if the team learns to play in a particular way uh, without this player then he's not going to be as, uh, he's going to spend more time on the bench and that can affect his chances for yeah. um, <coughs> so for national like, yeah. playing and things like that so which on is one, a like the one side there are the players that obviously maybe feel like they have a secure place and can afford to take the um, the fake injury card or play that fake injury card or need a rest day or a game off but probably most players would risk their bodies for that position we'll to find their it, spot like, and yep. even the good ones they, they can't afford to do it for long because yep. once they get overlooked or they get overlooked once or twice and you can see oh this team is managing actually better without that player suddenly my shape of my game has changed and it actually suits it and it's confused the other team a little bit you know when you're thinking about say for soccer you have a manager and I'm a big Chelsea supporter I know you're a Manchester United supporter we don't have to get into it <laughs> but at the moment let's say Mourinho he was like the special one why because he came up with quite a few different tricks that people weren't used to but once the other managers realised what way he was playing they would adapt their team accordingly. And if, say, the special player of the special one is not playing and they notice that they can adapt in a different way, then he won't play that player anymore. And that player obviously gets depressed because suddenly he's uh, not getting his bonuses, he's not getting a chance to play, he's not enjoying it, he's in the reserves... It affects how he's thinking. It affects a lot of a lot of things, and so it's quite hard for them to get back. So on the one side, they have the the physical ability, physiologically, that they can recover quickly, and they're a stronger and better place to recover quickly and respond to physiotherapy often. On the other side, they can get very very down and upset and angry with what's going on, um, and that will affect you know, how they're going to play in the future and, and possibly even their career. As I say, you're, you're playing with those, those two sides of everything. Um, so as yeah. much as I enjoy it, I, and, and, I mean, we've never really spoken about this. I mean, no, you're a foot, you were a football player and a uh, soccer player at high level. It's, have you ever thought of it like that, that that could possibly be what's happening? You, you probably felt, okay, I'm not playing, I'm fed up, I don't like not playing. But often it would give you the things that, oh, is it going to affect my career? Is it not going to affect my career? How are my teammates going to react to me? The manager's looking at me and suddenly the manager's thinking, well, actually, I don't need him in that position. A hundred percent of the time where I've suffered an injury, I came back too soon. Yeah, because, you, because either they want you back because you're in that that little window where he's still not changed his, his way of managing and you you want to get back. And you come back too soon and you know, that can actually really sort of prevent you playing. That's when it becomes chronic. Yeah, right? and it becomes chronic and it can prevent you playing at a high level and everybody says, well, he's not been the same since he, he was injured. Yeah, this is for anybody. You hurt yourself. The healing time frame for the, uh, for the body to heal is about six weeks. We go through a, a a process of inflammation. Now people look which at, is a scary word to some people. It's a big people, scary right? word, yeah. Exactly what I was going to say. It's this word inflammation. Immediately, anybody says inflammation, they think of infection, which is not. Or infection I, is inflammation going. Sorry. Or ibuprofen. Yeah. Well, I've explained a little bit about that now. If you, you get into the infection, which is a stage of inflammation when it's gone wrong. But for us to heal, we go through a period of inflammation. And that has its, its areas of whether it's like you've know, got redness, pain, swelling. <coughs> They're all relevant. 
because that stops you moving or using the affected part so it can then get healed. Chemicals are released, the tissue become heals, and the trick of a physiotherapist is trying to get that, hitch, that tissue, whether it be a ligament or a tendon or a muscle, to heal properly. But the usual period for, uh, for healing is about six weeks. Now, if you've got a decent hamstring tear and you uh, uh, need six weeks to heal, I've, not, I've never known a player take six weeks to heal from a hamstring. They might have done it later on because they had to, but most players will try to get back within three or four weeks, yeah. as, you, as you know, any muscle tear. But really, you should have about six weeks to let it all heal, stretch, the, get the... Uh, the collagen and the, and, and the various fibres to lay down as best they can, strengthen it, load it in the right way. That takes time. You don't have that time in sport. The thing you've got is that the player is usually, or the athlete is usually, um, a decent level of fitness that you can heal a little bit quicker. Uh, and that's about it. Psychologically, he's got a lot of motivation. And that's the big difference. But the problem is, is they will go back too early. That's the double-edged sword part of it. Because then you end up getting this thing getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse. It might not be as bad as the first insult, where I will use a hamstring as a good example of this. You get a tear in your hamstring. That's a pretty nasty injury. It should take anything from six weeks, two months to really heal properly. You can obviously get it back and moving and doing certain things within three weeks to a month, but then you get a, another little tear and another little tear. Similar thing for groin strains, another little tear, another little tear, to the point that it doesn't heal. One of the problems with hamstrings is, is when they keep getting these little tears, they're usually around the where the sciatic nerve passes down and splits, and all that sort of inflammatory exudate bathes around the sciatic nerve and makes it so hypersensitive. And so when people are doing hamstring stretches, they invariably are actually just stretching the sciatic nerve. And, um, and they keep feeling it. So it, it, uh, it responds with pain. And so they don't think they're ready or they, they act as such. The other thing is that sometimes the sciatic nerve itself, the muscle tissue will try and guard it. So it will contract around that... Um, uh, sciatic nerve, the hamstrings will contract, become very tense, and then as they run out, boom, goes again, and this is what this is what carries on. So people don't realise that you do need to use the the uh, the time frame to help you, but you don't always have that in sport. That's yeah, one of the, the, the different problems. And even when you do, it's just <coughs> pressure coming from so many yeah, different places, different places, agents, managers, managers, everything. Yeah, um, but. One Especially more the element. agent's part, your bonus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but the psychological part of the injuries, um, again, if we, if I talk about my personal injuries, you mentioned hamstring. I suffered from injuries on my right hamstring so often, unfortunately. Is there a psychological element where once you injure it once, it is more likely to come back in your experience? I'll tell you why I think that, because... If you, as a player, or as any individual who sprints or runs, when you feel it the first time, it's such an obnoxious pain that you feel. It's like almost you're almost anticipating it. Every time you sprint again, every time you run, it's like, when is it going to happen? When is that fake gun going to shoot at the back of my leg? Well, that's what I'm trying to say is because what will happen is, is you will get this tear and the tear will heal. Now, at some point, the same as a fracture will heal. A little bit, the time difference is of, or the timeline is obviously different. The muscle tissue will heal to a certain level. And that sensitivity around it will sort of go away. And then suddenly, you'll go out and you may do physical damage to it, but not, not a lot. But it will start an inflammatory action again. That inflammatory action, as I said, could bathe the sciatic nerve or nerve endings or nociceptors in the area. That will fill you back into your brain. And your brain will recognise that 
and I think it was Laura Mosley that he describes this thing of when he was uh, uh, in Australia and he was uh, um, he was walking and he, he trod on something and he thought he'd been bitten by a snake and he actually really badly reacted to it and they took him to the hospital and he'd actually stepped on a branch or something like that. And then he was out again several months later and he, this time he got bitten by a snake and he thought, oh, it's not, a, it's just a branch, and nearly died because he, uh, his brain had recognised that as, from his experience as being a stick. It's a similar thing, like you said, psychologically and physiologically. You've had this insult, this tear. You've had three weeks of having the manager tell you, can you get back, pushing you to come back trying to get the, the fitness coaches, the physios, the family, the fans, all wanting you to come back, all impinging on how you're you're going to do it. Physically, in the meantime, you're, you're healing and healing more and more and more and more. And then you go out and you get a little twinge because maybe you weren't ready. Maybe a trigger point has just gone or another one of the muscle fibres and you start that inflammatory reaction again. You're thinking of your sciatic nerve again. It's, it's all it's singing away there. Your brain has recognised that as something to put you out for three or four weeks. And it does the same again. Hopefully not for th three or four weeks. So the idea is to try and sort of train the body as much as possible. Not to get to that point. It's a psychological or a psychosocial approach as much as it is a, a physical approach to try and get... Um, uh, the the athlete back to normal, so definitely that, that that plays into it in a very very big way. Yeah, very important that you give yourself the time to to heal. Yeah, um, taking you <coughs> back before you started uh, studying, uh, mm -hmm. when you were in your travelling days, maybe your youth. Do you remember anything that an event, an injury, maybe, or an exposure to an, to someone else's injury that always like you just had that interest lurking in the back of your brain? Um, when I was at school, we were fourteen. Now I didn't go to one of the best schools in the world. I think it's fair to say um, a lot of the people I went to school aren't actually outside of uh, four walls at the moment but I went to uh, uh, not the best school but um, I wanted to be a dentist because uh, it never happened because the school I went to didn't even do A-levels so <laughs> I couldn't get into university but I always was interested in biology or zoology or anatomy and things like that so you had some anatomical yeah. well, my interest mom, yeah. my mum my mum was a dis my mum was disabled and um, she was uh she was one of the first people in Britain to have a, a heart valve put in. She's probably about the third or fourth person in the, the country. So my childhood was spent mainly going into hospitals with my mum because she was always in hospital at least twice a year, three times a year, having electric shots to get her heart beating properly or whatever. So I had that kind of nursing or whatever, caring sort of background in there. I liked sport. I liked the sort of biology and that brings me out to that book when I sat down with that book looking at what I wanted to do um, during my travels I well, I've said it in some of the courses I'm actually I don't know I should, maybe I shouldn't be sitting here because I've got so many things that I broke I mean I broke my left ankle badly in a motorcycle accident I completely ruptured my Achilles while I was at university I've broken my tibia three times I've got I mean, both knees have got tears in the meniscus which I never bothered operating on because I can't be bothered with it. I've torn my cruciate and ligament playing around in a nightclub with somebody on my shoulders when I slipped on the floor. Um, big operation on my abdomen. So do you think all this it's, yeah. you it's describing a lot of injuries and a lot yeah. of situations. Um, just situation. happened to me that I had yeah. to rehab from and yeah. But do you think having that um, experience yourself helps you today has helped you in your career yeah, definitely. approaching injuries with, with and, others? And all the different jobs I did. That was what, what was one of the big things that I never regret doing that because when I'm talking to a patient and I say, what do you do for a living? And they say, oh, uh, I cleaned floors. Okay. I cleaned a lot of floors. I know how the machine works and everything, how it spins around and you're moving it and everything. So I can put myself in their shoes and say, well, I know how that feels because it hurts your back and I know I've got back problems as well. How does it feel when you do such and such a thing? Oh, when I do that, like suddenly I'm, I'm on the same level then. So when I'm at the same level talking to them, but also 
I know physically what they've had, they have to do every day. And because I've done a lot of different jobs, I've seen that. And you'd be surprised. It's stupid little things like a barman. Some of you wouldn't think of a barman. If a barman's got a shoulder problem, that's a real menace for them to be able to do their job because they can't lift their arm up to put things up or take things down or reach down or go across or spin around. Things like that. You know, I've done that. I know how that feels. Um... Now, most people can imagine what you've got to do, but it comes to me probably a lot quicker because I've done that. And it was the same. I've injured myself. I had physio. I got treated. So they were things that I I can use for my own treatments. Um, but it also helped me decide to be a physio as well, as well as coming into uh, contact with a lot of people uh, in my family that and, needed it. Yeah, and do you think physios, therapists um, that do not have that personal experience with injuries or other jobs are at a disadvantage? Not necessarily. It probably may, may take them. It might be a little, a little bit easier for me to identify with it. That's all. Any physiotherapist, chiropractor, osteopath, worth their soul, any sort of therapist, should be able to think what is the thing that's causing it. Often they can bring it down to where the, the actual problem is, and that kind of brings me on to my approach in treating. When I'm treating, uh, every therapist, they've gone through all their, their things. I, say, I, t I teach quite a lot now. I teach students from various universities. Now. So I remember what happened was, we kind of went off on a tangent talking about football, but... When I went over to Israel, I was working. Now, I'm British enough that because I was from England, people were kind of treating me in a, as if I was some sort of specialist. But I'm not, I wasn't a specialist. And I didn't like that. It didn't sit well with me. So I went off and did my master's degree whilst I'm living, I was living in Israel, which basically meant every two months I used to travel back to England for uh, two weeks, and do my, part of my master's course, and then come back. And I did that for three years. Every two months back to England, work for two weeks, come back, and then I had to do placements again and everything like that. I then got my master's, and then I felt like I was a clinical specialist. Prior to doing my master's, from the day I left university, especially while I was in England, every two or three weeks I'd go and do a course. And I was actually... By every two or three weeks? Every two or three weeks, yeah. So it was either a taping course or a course on muscle imbalance or a course on neurodynamics or a course on manipulation or a course on uh, making orthotics or a course on... Just to expand your knowledge Just base. to expand my knowledge, yeah, because I never had a career before that. I'd been travelling and working in factories or cow sheds. So I, I actually had something that I was interested in. Brought, as you mentioned earlier, was there something that brought me into it? Finally, I was actually doing something I really wanted to do. That took me a while to get there, but I found I wanted to do it. All of those courses, they really help. And there's lots of different techniques in physiotherapy and chiropractic and osteopathy and in a, um, a massage therapy. And the, the, the beauty of physiotherapy is it allows me to do, as a physiotherapist, I'm actually allowed to do any of those. Um, as long as they're in my scope of practice, which they are, I can do it, whether it's manipulation, muscle energy techniques, uh, uh, dry needling, anything like that. I'm allowed to do that because legally I'm allowed to do that. Depending again on your country, but in the countries I've lived in, I've always been allowed to do it. I would treat people and I would find things that worked for me or not work for me. And I would try and utilize the things I'd learned. But I needed something that brought it together. And doing this master's, when I did this master's, really helped me because a lot of things in, in doing a master's in Britain, you're very much, it's not very frontal. It's not, you know, you're going to learn this. Often we would be the ones teaching each other. I would run a class one day. Somebody else would run a class one day. One day somebody was doing Pilates. Another day somebody would be doing Feldenkrais. I remember I'm the stiffest human being on this planet. And somebody put me on the floor and made me do Feldenkrais for a day. <laughs> the next day, me and the other guy, who was my age as well, we both literally had to be carried into the classroom because we couldn't move from doing all these exercises. All the fit young women were all doing, oh, that was such a good workout yesterday. We were sitting there crying in the back. But um, but we would be teaching each other. But what it did was it brought everything I'd learned together and it made me start thinking. And I remember being on a placement 
and somebody came in and started talking about uh you know how you would do your your clinical reasoning your assessments and everybody does their assessments chiropractors do them osteopaths do them massage therapists do them we all do them to lesser and greater degrees depending what it did for me was it started me thinking and I'm not reinventing the wheel it's not a new way of doing it it's exactly what people have been doing for years it just something clicked that there was a bit of a maybe a bit of a different approach I don't even like to say that because it sounds like I'm, I invented something new it didn't it was just just looking at it a little bit differently and I'll give you an example somebody comes in with an ankle sprain I mentioned ankle sprain earlier six months down the line the diagnosis is an ankle sprain the uh, the ultrasound or the uh, uh, investigations show a bit of a tear so people are acting towards it that's an ankle sprain six months down the line that probably that tear is not responsible for what's causing the pain there could be a lot of other things so I tend to look at it more of a sort of a structural the cause of the structure misbehaving, any mechanisms of pain that are available, whether it be a nociceptive, inflammatory, mechanical pain, or um, um, sort of whether there's an affective element and a psychological element you mentioned, or whether there's an autonomic element or central pain that's been managed completely by the brain and the central nervous system, and contributing factors that may be involved in keeping that going and I, and I call it like the scmc structure cause mechanism and contributing factors every assessment kind of looks at that but rather than coming up and saying oh you've got a a, um, a pain in your ankle you twisted your ankle it must be an ankle sprain you've done damage to the ligament um, i will try and look at the other structures what structures are involved what's causing those structures to misbehave and, and what mechanism of pain? So if we come to the ankle, somebody's twisted their ankle. Yes, they've got a ligament damage. Why is that? What's the cause of that? Is it the actual ligament so damaged that the ankle is flopping around and causing uh, another structure such as bone on bone to sort of rub? Is there another structure involved? Could it be a nerve tissue? that suddenly become inflamed because we know that the nerve, the uh, superficial perineal nerve sits on top of the anterior talofibular ligament, which is the one that always gets uh, strained. Has that become sensitized, like we were talking about the sciatic nerve, has that become sensitized in a hamstring? Has the uh, superficial perineal nerve become sensitized? Are the perineal tendons or any of the, the muscles around, uh, have, they, um, have they sort of become inflamed uh, got trigger points and so you need to treat them and if we look at each individual structure nerve bone ligament i can then use this sort of algorithm to how i'm going to treat am i going to treat by using something to brace the ankle electrotherapy to calm it down dry needling to release the trigger points exercises to stable uh, the ankle um, various uh, soft tissue techniques to get things moving there, that's the sort of approach that I will try and go on and using. And, and I've, I've found that very useful for me. And when I've been teaching it, very, very useful for my students as well. Uh, they seem to flow with that. And they, they come out from university and they say, well, we learned this, this and this, but that's actually made it a little bit clearer. And that's what my master's did for me. And that's utilising my physiotherapy experiences in football, in sports injuries, in clinic working for soldiers and working with soldiers in the military, putting that with all the courses I did and my masters, bringing that all together. Um, that's uh, how I've gone and uh, developed this approach a little bit more. Perfect. Uh, Paul, thank you for your time. It You're was, welcome. Uh, I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for listening. Please uh, head to our social media channels, our website, www.neilasher.com. Uh, to view more content and to to view listen to this um, podcast episode with Paul Townley. Thank you very much. <laughs>